Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. Invite those who are able to please stand for our first lesson. It comes from Luke's Gospel. Starting in chapter 2, the first seven words. Hear these familiar words of the Christmas story. Listen now to the Word of God. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to their own towns to be registered. And Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. And he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child." And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then our second lesson comes from the second chapter of Matthew, beginning with the first verse. Listen to the word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all Jerusalem with them, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me words that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that, had, that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Please stand for our third lesson. And this comes from the Revelation, chapter 12, also beginning with the first verse. And listen now to the Word of God. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. And then another portent appeared in heaven, and a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, 
and with seven diadems on his heads. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had as a place prepared by God. So there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This is the Sunday after Christmas, and it's always uh, a bit of a challenge to preach, to speak on a day like this, people that are gathered here, knowing particularly how we spent our last couple of days. Some of you may have spent yesterday assembling some of the Christmas gifts, and with my father-in-law, we uh, spent a few hours uh, putting together a trampoline in the backyard. I do have a theological reflection on that. Those of you familiar with poetry, with Dante's um, divine comedy and his journey into Hades, there was a sign over the entrance door to Hades that says, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. I'm now convinced that beneath that sign, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here, is this phrase, Assembly Required. Some of you had an opportunity yesterday to shop with uh, maybe some gift money or gift cards that you were given, a chance maybe to return discreetly a gift. Some of you, this is a season for second rounds of Christmas and visits taking place. I know that's taken people to Charlotte and, and other places around the country. For some of you, now is the time you're going to tour some lights Uh, taking a few Christmas sites that will be up during the week. And some of you are already looking to the new year, either plans for 1231 or in the weeks to follow. And I'm working on my first week of January too. For all of us on a day like today, we are a little tired, easily distracted. And you wonder how can folks focus on the message? Well, very simple. If you've listened to all the scriptures that were read and trying to figure out how is Jones going to connect those, you've got to pay attention. So I've got you hooked with that. Our primary lesson comes from the Revelation. And what I'm about to say, some of you all have heard before as I've spoken about it or taught it in a class several years ago. But there's certain rules of engagement when it comes to the Revelation. First, understand that it's a type of literature called apocalyptic, literature that is written to those in times of trial and distress and tribulation. It's meant ultimately to be an encouragement, but it's written a little differently. It's in a time where it's not safe for those who are not for those who are not inside the the family of faith to be able to read, read it. It needs to be read as an insider bit of information. Those inside would understand, those outside the family of faith would not understand. It's not safety for the writer to use plain language. And it relies on images to make a point and symbols and inside expressions. This was written to seven churches, and I'll elaborate later, but seven churches in western Turkey in the early 90s AD, a time of great organized persecution of the church. And so the writer relies on images to make a point. I think of one historic image uh, used many years ago to make a point. It was at the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and there was an editorial cartoon that portrayed Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, so on that great chair that he has, but Lincoln is leaning forward with his hands in his face, and he is weeping as a way of expressing the national sentiment at the time. 
We get it. But you could imagine to somebody not familiar with our country and our history and hearing some description of a statue leaning forward and weeping. You go, well, that doesn't make sense. Statues don't move. Well, you understand it's a symbol in a cartoon. We get the message. Or for symbols like this, and I'll draw uh, from the University of Georgia Bulldogs and the Auburn Tigers. You open the sports page and you see this headline, dogs, spelled D-A-W-G-S, dogs own the plane, or tigers crush the bulldogs. We know it's a sports page. We know the images that will come forth in that section and references. We get it. But again, if you're not from the United States, would it make sense to you? And then even this with expressions. Now, here's one. She just lost a loved one. Bless her heart. Or, he's dumb as dirt. Bless his heart. We know the difference. We know that bless his heart or bless her heart has about five layers of meaning based on the context, who said it, when it was said, and all of that. We get it. But for someone not familiar with that expression or other expressions and how we use them, the words may seem odd. So keep in mind, apocalyptic literature, throughout it will use symbols and expressions and images to make a point. Also remember, that first and foremost, that was a message to people living in Western, Tur- East, yeah, Western Turkey in the early 90s. It's first and foremost a message for them to which we can find an application today. It does speak to us today, but the revelation does not speak about political events as, as it is so often used. I remember back in 1989, and the Berlin Wall had come down. We still had East Germany and West Germany and the Soviet Union. And there was a question mark. Communism was falling throughout the world. And a question mark, though, was about the future of, of Germany. Would the Germanies, would they be able to reunite? Would the Soviet Union permit it? How would that come to pass? Well, I was watching this religious network and the particular program, and the man was explaining and says, we well, understand. West Germany will have to leave the European Union to be able to reunite with East Germany. That's the only way the Soviet Union will permit it. And then opening the Bible saying, see, it's got to happen that way because the uh, 10 out of 12 headed beast will come out of, of Europe and it'll be the exact boundaries of the Roman Empire. And so you see, it shows that that proves it. That's why Germany, West Germany must leave the, the common market. And they're going, oh, it's just like reading the newspaper, looking at the Bible. And I thought to myself, no. (laughs) The first people hearing this news were suffering persecution. They could have cared less about the the, the European Union. They couldn't give two denarii about how it would all be structured. It's first and foremost written to people in a specific situation. So we start there, knowing that there's images and symbols and it's to specific people, and then ask ourselves, who was that original audience? Seven cities in Western Turkey, in the midst of a sophisticated network of roads and commerce, efficient government, and many cultures living side by side. Imagine a place like New York City or Los Angeles or other larger metropolises. Side by side, many different groups living There's a common language and an overarching common culture that covers the people, part of a large and powerful empire. And for the looking at the stories of the particular cities, we see many parallels to cities today. Some cities were very historic, had decades, centuries, I should say, even thousands of years of history behind them. Some were known for their beautiful buildings. Some were known for banking and financial services. Some were known for their textiles. Ephesus was a great port city. 
And so it was known for commerce and a tourist trade, and one of the cities was the capital of the province. In many ways, we can look at these cities and find their counterparts in Atlanta and Savannah and Macon and Augustus and even in Columbus. This letter was written to everyday people like us. The Revelation is a series of sermons laying out history on a cosmic scale, and in the end, God wins, evil is defeated. So what in all of that do we have to say about this particular portion today? Well, simply put, this is the Christmas story, Revelation style. The woman is Mary, glorious for all that is about to happen with the birth of the great child, the Messiah. And that's why images of star, I mean of moon and star and, and sun appear. Twelve stars, twelve apostles. Simple as that, the foundation of the new church. And the dragon is Rome, the Roman government, and all who war against Christ and His church. So in that way, it applies even today. There are seven heads and seven diadems. There are seven hills in Rome. Ten horns. The current emperor was about the tenth emperor, or the tenth Caesar, going back to Julius Caesar. And so, for those inside, it's a bit of a kind of wink, wink, nod, nod. We know who we're really talking about in all of this. But again, if the, um, the government reads it, it's not going to necessarily make sense to them, putting it all together. Nevertheless, here, it is, here, it, here we are. The woman is there. She's about to give birth, and the dragon seeks to destroy the child. But the child is born, and the child is saved, and she is protected. This is the birth of Christ on the cosmic scale. We pair this then with our two more familiar Christmas stories. If this revelation is a cosmic scale, we scale down a bit for Matthew, discussing the birth in the context of the Jewish world there in their setting. These magi from the east have come to Jerusalem, the capital, and they speak to Herod. Now, he says he wants to go worship, so please tell me where this child is, is, is found. And that's really scary and creepy when you think about it, because what we see will follow, what will follow the giving of the gifts and all of this. Herod will order, he is so feared for his loss of power, he will order a massacre of all male children two years and younger. In a way, we see the dragon striking at the, um, at the church right there. Joseph will be warned in a dream, and the family flees to Egypt. They have financial resources now because of the gifts. I think that's where the gifts ended up, helping the family get its start. Joseph is a carpenter. He has a trade that he can take wherever he goes. And in Egypt, there's a large Jewish community. has been there for hundreds of years. So they can be amongst their own people while living in an exile of sorts there in, in Egypt. And then Luke gives us the most intimate story of all, focusing on a simple family, government business. They has to, he has to go back to the, the native town, the hometown, the base town of his family to register. The most domestic of details, she gives birth to a child and wraps the child. And shepherds come in from the community. They've been alerted to this wonderful thing, and they come to it. Later, they present Jesus at the temple when he is eight days old, and Simeon comes to see them, an old man who had been told, before you die, you will see the Messiah. And it happens. He sees the child who will be the Messiah. Now, I must admit that that experience that when you have a child, you become everybody's best friend. I mean, they all want to look and to ooh and to ah, and you strike up conversations, pleasant conversations, with the numerous people in various settings. And so Simeon comes up to ooh and to ah, but then he goes on and says this, this child 
is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own heart too, Mary. Wow. I can imagine her thinking, really, I would prefer, what a lovely child you have, and let it go at that. But no, she gets those kinds of words. So we get this hint, again, that something cosmic is happening. It's amazing when we look back at the stories and see who first worships Jesus. Magi from the East, outsiders, who somehow get an idea that something big has happened as they've studied the Scriptures of different religious groups, and they look at the stars, and they're putting things together. Those just a few miles away in Jerusalem don't get it. Or to the people like the shepherds who get, who get the first word in Luke's gospel and come to visit shortly after the birth. Now, we have an image of shepherds I think is pretty positive because of David, the shepherd king. But this event took place about a thousand years after he had reigned as king. And at the time and place of Jesus, the shepherds were a little sketchy in their reputation. Not necessarily bad, but if a shepherd came into the room, you double check, now where's my purse? Where's my wallet? Keep a handle on it. Most likely, you know, they, they could be nice, they could be good, but you just had to keep your eyes open around them. And so outsiders and sketchy characters are brought to the space. And even in Matthew's gospel, before this, we have the family tree of Jesus, and four women appear, Tamar, Bathsheba, Ruth, and Rahab. And really, only Ruth has the G-rated story in the family tree a reminder that God can use even the uh, untidy situations of life for His glory. <clears throat> three Christmas stories, three that anchor us in a cosmic story, a larger story for community, and a personal story as well. And so what does this have to say to us gathered here today? Well, I've said in other settings that for me, the Advent and Christmas season is really three events all rolled into one. There is the awe and the wonder as we mark the birth of Jesus Christ, God with us. God came to dwell among us. And we sing songs and hear songs like, O Holy Night, and Come All Ye Faithful, and Joy to the World. It's also a time of great sentimental fun, families gathering and reuniting, riding the pink pig in Lenox Mall and seeing Santa Claus, going to see lights in Callaway and other places. It's watching the Grinch and Rudolph. And we find that expressed in songs like, I'll be home for Christmas. And there's also a philosophical piece to it, this time of year, the year is ending. And so one begins to reflect on the year past. One begins to compare this Christmas to, well, what was going on? Christmas 2014 and 13 and maybe even back to the 60s and 50s in your cases. Where was I then and where am I now? And where will I be Christmas 2016? This song by John Lennon captured that sense very well. So this is Christmas, and what have you done? Another year over, and a new one just begun. A very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Let's hope it's a good one without any fear. All three come together at this time. And as we look at these three, we can easily get pulled into one direction or another. For some of us, we look at Christmas at this time as a great event, but not part of my daily life. It's an historic bit. Yes, I'll grant that it's a historic event, and yes, fun with the family, but really it's just something apart from my life. For some, we take it as a time to be with our group or set of groups, our network and how we're connected, and we just see it as that, just a time of 
again, the people being together. Or at times we make it too personal, just me and my personal faith with Christ, that's it. And we miss the other pieces of it. We need all three stories of Christmas to really get it, to appreciate it, and to bring it with us into the new year. Again, for Luke's account, we have something very personal, a small family, a new family, having to take care of business, going back to the ancestral town, and details like, what did the baby wear? And then shepherds from the neighborhood dropping in for a visit. Matthew enlarges our story to see the the larger consequences and adds more drama in that Joseph is told in a dream to go ahead and marry Mary. He is told in a dream to take the family away to Egypt and later advised to go back to Nazareth through a dream. And we see magi, outsiders, because at least the shepherds were insiders, they were fellow Jews, but these outsiders get it and come to worship. And yet those who knew the most, the chief priests, the scribes, all of these in Jerusalem have no clue. And we see the great political intrigues and disastrous consequences of Herod's actions. We see it in the larger group. But really, by looking at the Revelation, it anchors us to the largest picture of all and the cosmic battle that is taking place. Through these stories and understanding their relationship one with the other, we can grow in those three great gifts of hope and faith and love. We can see that hope is not based on sugar and spice and sentiment but it's based on a lasting hope in Jesus Christ, the Christ of Matthew and Luke and the Revelation. As we read these stories and see what has happened, we can grow in our faith, and that is trust. Faith is simply trust, and we learn more of the object of our faith. And in this, we see love most perfectly. A quote I've used before is that the will of God is love, and the love of God is not a sentiment of the divine mind. It's a purpose. We may not fully understand it all, but there's a purpose at work. Because of the birth of Christ, this matters on the largest of scales, our faith, and what we do in the community matters, as well as it matters to us personally, each one seated here. Now this season of the calendar will soon conclude. In the days ahead, we will wrap up celebrations. We'll pack up the Christmas decorations, and we will plan up the new year ahead. As we leave from this place today, please hear again that we are all part of a larger, epic, cosmic story that is all-encompassing And we are part of a story that is very personal for us as a group, as well as for each individual seated here today. You, me, we are all part of this Christmas story. Thanks be to God. Amen.